Hi everybody, today we're going to be doing a review on perioperative nursing. Learning objectives uh, for this lecture is to define the role of the nurse in the different phases of perioperative care for patients. Um, pay special attention to complications. Know what the role of the nurse is with informed consent. Identify comorbidities that would impact a patient's perioperative care and discuss why. And know the role of the nurse as it relates to surgical asepsis. Lecture materials, uh, Pelico Chapter 5, your ATI Skills Module, the Surgical Asepsis, and your ATI Med Surge Nursing um, Edition 10, Chapters 94 through 96, uh, focus on these for testing purposes. So know your patient population, uh, elderly patients older than 65. Um, you can see some issues with them on page 105 of Pelico, Table 5-2. Children, obese patients, patients with disabilities, smokers, diabetics. Um, the populations that are asterisks, um, there's going to be some different issues with those. Obviously, children populations, um, there are going to be issues in terms of emotional uh, management of those. Um, child life specialists usually are really good for children um, to kind of help them through the process, especially um, if surgery is warranted. Smokers know that healing is going to um, be slower for them as well as diabetics. When um, the perioperative nursing, this is basically going to be the period of time that begins once surgery has been decided and agreed upon and ends once the patient enters the OR suite. So you want to get a good patient history. You want to know the current medications and over-the-counter meds. Um, over-counter meds, there's some more information about that on page 111 in your Pelico book. But over-counter the meds, what most patients don't realize, there are some that can actually increase their risk for bleeding, which obviously is one issue that we want to prevent while in surgery. Um, some of these medications include your NSAIDs, aspirin, um, and also some herbals. Um, kind of a good, good rule of thumb is most most herbals that start with the letter G uh, incre increases a person's risk for bleeding. Um, if they have any bleeding disorders, history of malignant hypothermia, allergies, uh, diseases of pulmonary, renal, or urinary tract, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, endocrine, or hepatic system, pre-existing mental or physical disabilities, and pregnancy status. Women that are of childbearing age should have a pregnancy test done. If they refuse, they need to sign a waiver or follow your facility's policies. Um, hold anticoagulants from 7 to 10 days prior to surgery. Those include things like warfarin or aspirin. Lab work. Know your basic values and what to report. Um, Pre-surgical testing and procedures, needle location, mapping of a cell system, patient prep, um, that can be ball prep, HIPAA cleanse, shaving, IV placement, and removal of nail polish. Know what medications to administer. Patients should have had nothing by mouth, depending on what time their surgery is. And there needs to be an updated history and physical on file before surgery happens and informed consent that we'll talk about later in understanding what your role is as a nurse. Informed consent, it is the responsibility of the provider to obtain consent after discussing the risks and benefits of the procedure or surgery. The nurse can clarify any information. Um, the nurse can witness the signing of the consent form after the provider obtains consent to treat. So informed consent um, is not, when you think informed consent, that's not the consent form itself. Informed consent is basically an agreement um, that the patient is agreeing to allow the physician to do a procedure to them. So that's between the physician and the patient. Your role as a nurse, again, you can clarify some information. For example, if 
they look at the consent form and it says um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy and the patient says well I thought the doctor's taken out my gallbladder you can clarify that that is medical jargon um, for gallbladder removal um, things like that you can't clarify informed consent um, is needed for certain procedures um, like electroconvulsive therapy Believe it or not, some medications um, patients have to give consent to, seclusion, restraints, and again, obviously, invasive procedures. Patients can only sign a consent form if they're 18 years or older, mentally capable, and not under the influence of medication that can affect judgment. So if you are a perioperative nurse, do not give your patients some versed. Um, and then think you can get them to sign a consent form because they would be under the influence of a medication that causes short-term amnesia. So let's not do that. Um, know what to document. Um, things like reinforcement of information um, given by the provider. Any regular occurrences and the use of an interpreter. Of an interpreter if you use one. Use common sense when it comes to patient allergies. Um, patients love to tell you everything under the world, what they're allergic to. Uh, just know the ones that are pertinent um, to the hospital environment. So if somebody says they're allergic to cats, you would not want to give that information to a physician or a surgeon because, quite frankly, he doesn't care. because That's going to have nothing to do with his surgery. But I like this cartoon here. Um, interoperative nursing that begins when the patient is transferred onto the OR table and ends with the admission to the PACU or the floor at times kind of depends but typically the PACU. So there's a handoff um, before leaving the pre-op where you're basically getting all the information who the patient is. Make sure you have the right patient that the consent is signed, that the H&P is updated, um, all labs are fine. Um, during this time you are the patient advocate. Um, you're in charge of knowing their allergies, helping with positioning, keeping their dignity, um, keeping them warm, um, know your malignant hypothermia, uh, malignant hypothermia, hypothermy, um, protocol, hypothermia, excuse me, protocol, know where the crash cart is, how to use the crash cart, and understand types of sedations and their side effects. Um, for example, locals that are used spinal epidurals can cause spinal headaches. So do know how to um, manage a patient who is having a spinal headache for testing purposes. Know aseptic technique, which you learned in first um, semester. Um, patient prep, the timeout, basically this is a time right before the surgeon cuts that you basically make sure you have the right patient if laterality is involved. Um, that's stated, the informed consent is read so we know what surgery is going on. The count, um, that the um, sterile markers have been checked, all instruments are in the room, everyone agrees to procedure, and everyone in the room has to agree um, before the doctor can or surgeon makes incision, and that is part of the timeout. Um, and again, the instrument sharp count that happens before timeout, and a nurse's role obviously is documentation during surgery um, while, while it's going on. Malignant hypothermia, this is an acute life-threatening condition. Basically, it's a hypermetabolic condition causing alteration in the calcium activity in the muscle cells. It can lead to muscle rigidity, hypothermia, and damage to the central nervous system. Um, triggering agents are going to be inhalation, anesthetic agents, and silicolene. Um, treatment is basically you have to stop surgery, administer IV detrolene, 100% O2, obtain ABGs, infuse iced IV, um, normal saline, cooling blankets, and dialing catheter for I's and O's, which um, most patients um, typically do have a catheter in place. Spinal headaches, this is caused by CSF leakage from spinal epidural local anesthetics. Manifestations 
typically happen when the head of the bed is elevated. So treatment is keep the patient flat to, prom to promote the dura tear to seal. Keep them in a quiet environment and hydrate the patient to help replace the um, cerebral spinal fluid loss. So make sure you know how to uh, manage a patient with a spinal headache. Surgical asepsis, um, just to give you a sense, if you um, ever have an opportunity to go into an OR that basically from the waist up is sterile, um, from the waist down is non-sterile. But interestingly with this patient, what is actually wrong is that um, never turn your back to a sterile field because if you do turn your back to a sterile field, technically whatever behind you should be considered non-sterile, but um, I didn't draw this picture. So dress for the zone. Different areas of an operating room um, require different type of clothing. The areas in green basically you can be in normal clothing. Semi-restrictive zones you should be in scrubs, um, at least have um, a bonnet on, but you don't have to have a mask. Um, in the restricted zone, which is the operating room, you need to have scrubs, um, masks, eye protection, and a bonnet on your head if you're not doing surgery. Postoperative nursing, this basically begins when the patient is admitted to the PACU or the post anesthesia care unit. Frequent nursing assessments are vital. You want to make sure the patient has a patent airway, head of the bed 15 to 30 degrees unless contraindicated. If a, per, if a person has decreased level of consciousness, um, you should put them in the lateral position. Um, watch for hypotension and shock. Um, this is more likely to happen if there is a blood loss of 500 mLs. Um, may indicate that replacement is needed if you see. Um, watch for hemorrhaging, hypertension, and arrhythmias, pain and anxiety, nausea and vomiting, which can be caused by a lot of anesthetics, um, line strains, monitoring or care, and obviously outpatient um, surgery will require discharge teaching. So some post-operative complications that you should be familiar with at Alexis's. It happens within the first 48 hours. Your signs and symptoms, interventions, incentive spirometer, hydration, uh, turn cough, deep breathing every two hours. You want to monitor the respiration rate and rhythm, early ablation, hypostatic pneumonia can happen after 48 eight after 48 hours. See the sign and symptoms, febrile, tachycardia, tachypenia, crackles and bronchi. Again, interventions will be in some spirometer, hydration. Turn, breathe, deep cough every two hours, mucolytics and early ambulation. Um, and then respiratory depression, obviously, because a lot of pain medications are opioids. Um, the one thing you'll see with all these, obviously, especially the first two, is the use of incentive spirometer, um, term breathing and coughing, and early ambulation are going to be very important to ward off pneumonia and atelectasis. Some other complications, hypoxia. This is, of course, a deficiency in tissue perfusion. Um, know your signs and symptoms, and obviously you want to try to resolve the underlying problem that may be causing this. Um, O2 therapy is going to be important. Nausea, um, comfort measures, antiemetics, relaxation, sometimes NG tubes are needed to decompress the stomach depending on the surgery. And that also helps to decompress some of the intestines as well because of the dilation. Um, shock can happen immediately or up to 48 hours. Know your signs and symptoms of shock where you have decreased blood pressure, pulse, and urinary output. Person becomes lethargic, cold and clammy, and pale skin, and they can have stupor. Um, interventions, obviously, is to replace fluids. Um, position them in Trendelenburg if you're suspecting shock, which this is basically help getting blood um, to the main organs and administer vasopressors as prescribed. Urinary retention or hesitancy, 
This is the inability to void, to void. A person may be restless, have bladder distension that you may see, you may physically see it if the person's really tiny or upon scan. A person may also have an increased blood pressure. Sometimes it's a matter that a patient's not getting enough privacy um, in order to void. The bladder scan may validate that there is um, retention, offer a bedpan, monitor the I's and O's, um, an in and out catheter may be prescribed because um, most times they don't want to have Foley's in long term, but if a scan shows a large amount of urine, in and out catheter might be enough to kind of relieve the issue, um, allow the patient enough time to be able to avoid on their own. Decrease uh, peristalsis or paralytic ileus. Um, signs and symptoms, hypoactive or absent bowel signs or no flatus. So usually that is something that's important to ask your patients um, as if they are being able to pass gas. It's not always as important to ask them about bowel movements, um, but passing gas will usually be one of the first things um, that they will experience. So if this is suspected they may do an NG to decompress the stomach, limit narcotics because that can increase constipation, get the person up and moving, or they may give them something like a prokinetic agent like metoclopramide, which is also called Reglin, um, to kind of get things moving along, but that is um, only given as prescribed. Wound hemorrhage. There's a slide that we'll look at next. I'll talk about some um, complications with wounds. Obviously, you want to look for bleeding from drainage tubes or surgical sites. That is more than normally expected. Watch for signs for shock. Assess the site. Know the early signs. Monitor the, any drainage devices. Uh, make sure you keep the drainage device patent, that there's no kinks and tubings, uh, and avoid tension to the site. Here is, in terms of wound issues, especially wound healing with those who are in a in, in you, immunocompromised state, um, those who are on like long-term corticoid steroid use, those with lupus, um, rheumatoid arthritis, um, Cushing's disease or Addison's, those with uh, nutrition deficits or diabetics because if they're uncontrolled they can have a heightened state of hyperglycemia which slows healing and of course smokers. <clears throat> Two issues you can run into is wound dehiscence um, which you see right here where basically the muscle is exposed versus a uh, wound evisceration where you actually see protruding bowel. Um, now, I did have this happen once when I was on the floor with some students where there was wound evisceration. If this ever happens to you with a patient on the floor, um, obviously this is an instance where the provider does need to be contacted, uh, but in the meantime, what you would do is get some sterile uh, gauze and saline. You will soak the saline um, and get it covered and basically cover up the area with um, sterile wet gauze until the surgeon arrives. Get the patient prepped and back to the OR. Common meds that you should know. Know your anti-emetics, Zofran, Federgan, and Reglin. Um, anticholinergics like atropine. This can help decrease the risk of bradycardia during surgery and uh, vagal slowing of the heart due to um, the parasympathetic response to surgical manipulation. Some of the adverse effects of that is retention, tachycardia, and dry mouth. Vitamin K is an antidote for Coumadin and your protamine sulfate which is an antidote for heparin. Uh, basic discharge criteria for most patients um, that they are with it, their level of consciousness, uh, they have stable vital signs, they can drink, they can urinate, no nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath or dizzy, and obviously no bleeding. So again, um, make sure you review your ATI resources under the skill module, surgical asepsis. It has a lot of neat videos and FAQs about the OR that will benefit you. Um, I don't think you guys do OR rotations anymore. Um, 
So I should have probably taken that out because I don't think you have it this semester. Um, and other good resources are your chapters 94 to 96. So let me know if you have any questions.